because he is frighteningly, insanely bad at writing. I, I don't send me some hey. encounter argument to that. I have his book. He has his name on it. It was written by a ghostwriter. Okay. The ghost of who? <laughs> hey. I can't think of a good... Some dead Franciscan clown. I've, I, I can't even think of anything because it's just... It doesn't even make any sense. I recently um, narrowly avoided death because I was given $15, I believe, by a chatter two months-ish ago to read Ben Shapiro's True Allegiance. Ben Shapiro's, I believe, only foray into fiction released by Post Hill Press November 1st, November 1st, 2016. A, a true... Not quite October surprise for an election that surprised all of us. Um, ben Shapiro's True Allegiance is a off, off, according to its own page on Google Books, a novel that asks how close are we to our country's collapse and will we be able to stop it once it begins? Um, I will tell you right now, it barely answers that first question and does not answer the second. Um... In short, if you don't want to watch the entirety of this, and I'm going to do this like I've done before with uh, Shadowversity's book and, and other people's things that I've critiqued, I am going to obliterate this book start to finish, spoilers-wise. I will also probably be making fun of it extensively because this book is fucking trash. Um, but my quick overview of it is uh, Ben Shapiro's True Allegiance is barely even a book. Um, I don't know why he thought he could write it. I have some suppositions that what it really is is just a collection of the conspiracies that he was going to try to peddle as a propagandist and known liar um, in order to foment dissent and derision amongst the people of America and um, potentially scare them during a Hillary Clinton presidency, uh, even though Donald Trump ended up winning just a few days after this book was released. Uh, it is it is bad, and it barely constitutes an entire story. It is racist. I can say fairly unequivocally, it is a racist book. Um, there are There is one, one good Muslim character... And one good black character that I can remember. And they are the same guy <laughs> in this book. Every other Muslim, almost to a number, is either a swarthy, slinking conspiracist who is trying to overthrow the West. Um, every black guy is a duplicitous career criminal trying to... Um, overthrow the police in order to take advantage of their cities or a um, ignorant easily emotionally manipulated person person is the word I'm using definitely not the word that Shapiro thought when he was writing the book an easily manipulated ex um, who will get excited at the drop of a hat and riot Almost instantaneously. I can say light trigger warning. If you're here, there's nothing you are not going to have heard before. Um, I will not use any of the racial epithets that are in the book. There are some. Uh, but yeah, there is, there is the presence of racism. <laughs> kind of throughout the book. Um, and there is not the presence of a really cohesive singular plot. That makes almost any sense. The one unifying villain in the plot is, at my best estimation, the concept of leftism, but also really just the understanding that some people kind of aren't really human. And trying to be extra nice to them will just screw off, screw over uh, the kind of people who really kind of actually are human and useful. 
Um, it is a book written by what I can only describe as a sociopath. The characters are almost anything but. Uh, to call them cardboard would be an insult to the dimensionality of cardboard, which generally requires at least three pieces of paper um, to, to create a corrugation and then two ceiling layers. The, the description, the full description of the most complicated character, Brett, um, who is the main character, sort of, kind of, if it filled... Uh, if it could fill more than a stub article in a wiki, I would be stunned. It would have to just be grab bag plot related moments in order to fill it up. It is hardly even a book. Um, I think it took me actually three hours or so, maybe three and a half to read. It is because it is the most difficult to look at book I have ever experienced. It is repellent to, to the bottom. Um, I, I think I can start this off by... W w w let me just give a background on Ben Shapiro himself if you're popping through this for the first time because you are a, uh, a fan of literature and, and, and shit like that. Ben Shapiro is a Jewish-American bigot from, I believe, California. He is a failed violinist who got to go to Harvard because his parents paid for him to. Uh, when he graduated, he had no real skills because as a Nepo baby, he was quite literally too stupid to do anything valuable to the human race. And so he became a full-time propagandist. His notable claim to fame is climbing through the ranks of YouTube. He's a YouTuber um, by being mean to uneducated college kids. I like to think in my mind that if it wasn't for nepotism and racism, uh, Ben Shapiro's entire family would starve. Because there is nothing of value to him otherwise. He is a charisma black hole. I think he's a very stupid person. I've, there's never been a, a, a contradictory fact to that. Um, but dumb people who are impressed by somebody talking extremely fast and saying nothing uh, give him a lot of extra credit. Hassan Piker, notable streamer. <laughs> provocateur has to be the hardest word Hassan knows I swear to god uh, he, he's, he's like uh, he has respect for uh, Ben Shapiro I, I, I don't um, and it really shows in this book the depth of Ben Shapiro's ignorance about the most fundamental aspects of the world from almost every vantage imaginable the only thing I know that he knows from watching or reading his book is entertainment and not even good entertainment. He just knows about talking head stuff and manipulation, which is quite literally bottom of the barrel, the easiest thing you can do. Um, it, it's basically for people that don't have enough charisma and in Ben in Ben's case, literally are too short to ever become politicians. Sorry, Ben, you're five, eight or whatever the fuck five. See, I don't, <laughs> If it doesn't start with a six, I mean, come on. With all that said, I'm going to pop into this. And um, stand by is all I can say. I'm going to go probably faster than I think. I have written this. I, I actually didn't write it. I have it on my phone. As you can see, there he is. Ben Shapiro's True Allegiance. And I have things um, highlighted throughout the entirety of it. But mostly so I can actually just even fucking remember what happened. Um, I'll probably get into it quickly, but Ben is not a good writer by even freshman collegiate standards. He's god fucking awful. Uh, unironically, like, I don't know if he has brain damage or not. Levels of bad at writing. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he had some, like, kids that his parents paid or he paid to do his essays and shit for him in school because he is frighteningly, insanely bad at writing. I, I don't send me some fucking counter argument to that. I have his book. He has his name on it. It was written by a ghostwriter. Okay. The ghost of who? <laughs> I can't think of a good... 
some dead Franciscan clown. I I can't even think of anything because it's just it doesn't even make any fucking sense. Um, I'm gonna read chat for just a second because I think there's actually some funny shit in here, and then we're gonna get into the uh, we're gonna get into it. There's this book is broken into three parts, by the way. So at the end of each part, part I'm gonna stop and talk to chat. So if you if it if you feel like I've been going too long and telling you too much about Ben Shapiro, but you're saving a moment, there's a moment that you've been waiting for where you're like, oh fuck, I, I, I this is the joke I want you to see. Save it for that. I will also be turning it from live chat to top chat. Shout out everybody. Um, and here we go. Just a picture of Ben, but six seven and swole. I can't even imagine that. You know, like when when people are in really good shape. I just thought, like you look like when you have, when you're sufficiently large enough and sufficiently jacked, your traps start looking like just a smaller person's shoulders. Like you're a little tinier person inside, like a bigger person's meat suit. Ben Shapiro doesn't even have the build to be the shoulders coming out of the shoulders. <laughs> Can't have two POCs, best combine them. I mean, for real. I came up with a thing while I was reading this. Um, and so, you know, I, I, there's no way. To, this is just, it's all going to sound dumb as shit. So I've just been trying to figure out for like the life of me for years now. Um, what Jewish Americans that are conservative hope to gain by empowering conservatives excessively because eventually it all just, it's all Turner Diaries at the end. I, you, just, you have to know that. The second there's the second there's any, like, no more impediment and no more people in the way, they're not going to let you live and let live somewhere. They're going to fucking kill all of you too. And I was always wondering what it was that motivates them. And I thought of... The Peter Griffin, like, these colors okay, these colors not okay, like, mix, right? Like, right, like you know, white, Caucasian, and, like, not, not okay, okay, not okay. And so, I, want, I, I think that there's an, a belief for, like, good ones in different races that aren't white, right? You know, like, I'm, I'm, but I'm one of the good ones, right? That if you do a genocide against one race that's browner than you... It gives you a genocide point up into a whiter race. I believe that that's what they think, which sucks for like the darkest skinned people. You can never genocide, genocide yourself up because you're stuck forever right at the bottom. But I feel like if you're, you know, some flavor of like Mediterranean tone and you genocide a dark, you, th you think that you can, that, that's like an honorary Caucasian because we're the best at genocides. Like, all the time you know what i mean learn from the best uh i i just think that's a concept i thought of and like it sounds insane but it won't go away in my head it's just it's just stuck there like the, you like you know like the racial draft on the old dave Chappelle skit like the racial draft it's just like i, I it, you imagine that but for like but, like, imagine Star Wars, right? And it's the end of a Star Wars where you want... And they're all walking up and they're giving out the medals. But it's like... But it's like Space Hitler. And he's just giving, like, an official white medal to, like, a fucking Israeli as they're like, Hey, we did the genocide. And like... Like congratulations, you made it. You got all the way to the tippity tip tip top. Like fucking welcome, I guess. <laughs> Still gotta enter through the back door, but you're now you're now officially one of the good ones. <laughs> it's a little pin, one of the good ones. <laughs> oh my god. Idea checks out race prestiging to lighter tones. <laughs> I could see him writing a, a buddy cop screenplay with Chuck Norris and Steven Seagal in mind and calling it Maximum Vengeance, The Revenge. You're giving him way too much credit. That's actually interesting. I like trash. I'll read it. Like I, I got to preface getting into the heart heart of this by saying I have actively been reading Undead Unluck, which is garbage. It's probably the worst written shonen I have ever picked up 
without being boring. It's very entertaining. I don't know why. The plot has basically retconned itself like five times already into completely different directions. And now I think, I think I'm only like 30 chapters in. And now I think that the entire thing is about to full retcon itself. Like they're giving warning signs that all of Undead Unluck is just going to full retcon itself into a completely different story, which would be hilarious to me and fine. Um, But (laughs) I will read trash as long as it's entertaining. I can say unequivocally, like this, this story isn't, overall grosser than Shadowversity's Shadow of the Conqueror, but it is less competent in almost every imaginable way, which is fucking saying something. Uh, I'm going to hop into it. (laughs) I read Undone Unluck. It's a good time as long as you kind of unfocus your brain. You can't pay attention to the previous chapter. In Undead Unluck. You have to ignore whatever just happened because five more minutes of reading that story and you're, it, it's whatever you learned is gone now. <laughs> ben Shapiro's True Allegiance. Chapter Prologue. New York City. First sentence, I feel like I should always read the first sentence. This is it. This sets the tone for the entire book. This is the artistic intro to a person's book, okay? (laughs) Don't read it like Ben Shapiro, Tyler. Steel man, steel man, steel man, steel man, steel man. (laughs) By the time Jennifer Collier hit the George Washington Bridge, it was already almost 9 a.m. rush hour. Oh, sorry. My bad. By the time Jennifer Collier hit the George Washington Bridge, it was already almost 9 a.m. I'll read the entire graph as though it's the first. Rush hour. The bridge had turned into an enormous parking lot. Probably amongst the best pros in the entire book. Okay. This book starts off in New York City in a prologue that takes place... Almost the entire book after, uh, like, later, right? So immediately after this prologue, we're going to go back in time. Just understand that. In this, we have Jennifer Collier and her daughter, Julie, the J and the J. Uh, They're on a bridge. The bridge starts groaning, and then it collapses. Um, All of the cars fall off, and they probably die. It's, It's very... And I'm going to come back to this about a thousand times. It is very Team America World Police. If you told me that Ben Shapiro had Team America World Police up on the wall behind him during this, and that's the only way I could get through most of it, was pretending Trey Parker and Matt Stone were reading it to me, um, I would believe you 100%. Because it is basically as stupid as any of the weird little disaster scenes that happen. The the bridge collapses and it falls apart. I didn't highlight anything else in there, so we don't need to really get into it. Trust me, I'm fine. Uh, We immediately go to Kabul, Afghanistan. Part one before. How long before? Who knows? But just, it's fucking awesome that we go from the prologue, which means before the story, like prologue, like before we speak, log you, Uh, to part one before. (laughs) Which I love. Almost as much, almost as much, almost as much as Haritos. Haritos. We are introduced to Brigadier General Brett Hawthorne, um, who is a Brigadier General. You guys don't know anything about military ranks, so I will explain them. Generals come in four flavors, sometimes a secret magical fifth flavor, right? Be my little general. Brigadier, major, lieutenant, and then just general. And then sometimes when it when when we're at World War, we have the um army general. I can't remember what the fuck it was called. I, I lost it. 
but the uh, the five star general of the army, right? So the the overarching armed forces commander general, people like George Patton, I believe, was a five star. They're extremely rare. Those are appointed only in 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 occasions of extreme necessity, because generally the armed forces operate better with limited uh, unified oversight. They actually work better as independent entities doing the specific jobs they need. You would be stunned to find out that micromanagement actually dog shit everywhere. Who knew? Um, brigadier, major, lieutenant, and then general. Um, to become even just a brigadier general takes a act of Congress. And that is when you move from the, uh, I can't remember the, the segments, but this is the general officer ranks below. That is the staff officer or something like that. I can't remember field grade officer. I think actually it is company grade below. That's company grade officer below. That's field grade officer. So starting at the bottom, depending on what unit of service you are, these will go from Oh one to about Oh eight Oh nine. If you have magic, um, lieutenant, right? Butter bar, lieutenant with a gold bar uh, or second lieutenant, first lieutenant with a silver bar, captain with two bars, all right? By the time you get to be a captain, this is very important because this amount of information he has never engaged with in his life at all. Ben Shapiro does not know any of what I'm telling you. Um, I actually, I do. I, I know plenty of that. Like, if he had like an hour to research it before he made like a like a recorded and like pre written video, then maybe. Um, to become a captain, captain takes like in the ballpark, depending on where you are, of like four to eight years ish. Like you graduate as either a butter bar or maybe a first lieutenant if you're like the best in your class kind of deal. Um, but promotion through officer ranks is considerably more difficult and like fraught with issues than uh, promotion through enlisted ranks, which generally happens sort of on a kind of timeline or you get like booted out. I'm not going to get into the very deep specifics, but understand that it's almost like a somewhat exponential curve between ranks to go from captain to major um is anywhere from like five to eight years i think depending on your job sometimes it can be something really really small and really fast like two if you're in an mos or a service section that needs promotion there's all kinds of ways to break these rules that i'm giving you but just understand like a major general is going to be somebody or a major just a major major the first of field grade officers a major is going to be in charge of a whole fucking battalion, 1,200 people, right, um, or even more. After that, you have a colonel, uh, lieutenant colonel, silver or a gold oak leaf. Um, a lieutenant colonel is in charge of like, uh, well, a major can be in charge of like a company, right, uh, which is like a series of platoons. Um, or a battalion. A battalion is definitely going to be at least a major, if not a colonel, a full bird colonel which is a little sideways bird instead of oak leaves is what you need to be when you're actually in charge of shit in charge of shit. By the time you make it to Colonel, you're pretty much set in your career. A Colonel has been in, you know, like 15 ish years from Colonel. Then you can move into general ranks. You stay in Colonel for a long time. Most people don't move past it at all because there's not a need for general officers. Um, general officers, are when you cross from being in the military um, and maybe a little bit into politics, politics to being into politics. Generals are not in charge of people anymore. They are in charge of like large swaths of the military. But what generals do as opposed to like colonels and majors is they deal with the politics of the military. These are guys who are making phone calls to people on, con on on Congressional Hill, to other generals, to people in other units that they have known, they have met for you know after multiple decades of service, in order to get things done to grease wheels, to get guys that they want promoted promoted, to get guys that they don't want in charge of something moved to another place, to get this moved over here, that moved over there. These guys are really just only management. They don't do shit. By the time you get past to brig get to brigadier general is almost most people's entire life to go to major and lieutenant is 
even more of a commitment to get to general general it the last job you'll ever have you're probably going to have been in for 35 30 or 30 to 35 plus years every general you see is an old fucking man uh colonels are generally fucking like gray hairs right just full birds all those guys, they, they wield like powers like God can. A general officer can look at a private and if they want, if they so choose, make them a gunnery sergeant with a staff because they feel like it. They don't abuse that power because of the difficulty of getting into that and because other generals and other colonels and stuff sort of have like say over whether or not you get promoted and, and there's a, a lot of politics. It tends to be relegated to only people that are very, very good at playing the system, at understanding the needs, and who really, like, kind of want to really be in charge of the military. They don't want to work at the lower levels anymore. They don't want to work in the field. They don't want to do combat stuff because they could still do that. They could stay colonels. There's colonels that stay colonels for forever. They just stay as a colonel for 35 years because they just want to run infantry regiments or they just want to run you know, whatever the fuck and not bother with that stuff. It's quite, po it's quite literally possible to do that because when you transition into those areas, um, you, you, you can just do it. But so I just understand that anybody that makes it to general is going to be an old fucking man. And with all due respect, uh, nowhere near by any fucking measure in, as in shape as the vast majority of the people that work for them. Because, you have traded your youth for experience. This is a very necessary thing. You are now giving your experience as a military man instead of your body. That is such a fucking crucial thing to understand when we start getting into this. Because the guy I have just introduced you to is a brigadier general. We are introduced to him looking at his M9 magazine and cursing to himself because it's empty. He is alone in Afghanistan, and we will find out why. <laughs> he was set up against a mud brick hovel in the city's poor part of town. Even in Kabul, there was a large in <laughs> Kabul. Kabul or Kabul, who knows? Um, there was a large income gap, and felt the sweat trickle down cold between his shoulder blades. He hadn't been alone for years. Generals always had a personal security detail, <laughs> but things had gone hellishly wrong. Hawthorne was a bear of a man, 6'3 in his bare feet and 215 pounds in his underwear. I don't know why you added that. With graying, with a graying blonde crew cut and a face carved of granite. So we meet our guy, our killer, our cool dude, Brigadier General. Um, Brett, whatever the fuck his name is. I've, I've seen it and read it a thousand times. Hawthorne. Um, remember what I explained. When you get to Captain... You have a personal security detail usually made up of two to three fire teams of guys. The full bird colonel, I uh, was on the personal security detail. It's not that cool. It's just another, it's just another job. Um, on my last deployment, had an entire full platoon and a half. I think it was like literally a platoon and a half worth of guys. Multiple squads, right? One squad for a captain, multiple squads for just a colonel. When you go anywhere as a colonel or as a captain even, your personal security go detail goes with you. Generals only work around colonels and majors. So when he's there, his personal secur security detail, which will be an entire dedicated security detail that's like a specific MOS, right? And then Every fucking security detail for every officer that works for him will be there as well. We have been, I have been in that parking spot, right? Writing in, you're a little turret gunner. Time for the colonel to go meet with his fucking peons on some other base. You drive him over and then all of your security details party together because it's gangster shit. All right. He's at the top. He has hundreds of dudes around him. Thousands, right? Hundreds just to protect him. Thousands spreading out. Thousands upon thousands. Literally, battalions. <laughs> it's very basic. To get a general alone in the United States military would be fucking absurd. To the point where it has never happened. 
we didn't lose anything, I believe, over like a major in the entirety of the Iraq war. Losing lieutenants up to captains happens. It's, it is what it is because they're, they're fucking field grade. They're, they're in the field. But like company grade is gnarly. Like for a fucking major to get clipped or his entire security detail to get wiped out would be the craziest thing that happened in the entirety of the Iraq war. Literally crazier than some of the war crimes you might be thinking of. Like Abu Ghraib, shit like that fucking happens, all right? But you're talking about taking an actual like combat L. Unspeakably impossible. A general. <laughs> and, and by the way, we find out as we get into this um, that this dude is basically just a, a commambulation of uh, General Petraeus, who was a Marine Corps general in the Afghanistan conflict. And General McManus, I believe his name was. I can't fucking remember offhand, and I don't care to look it up. Um, but between the two of them, they both had uh, kerfuffles as um, former and current leaders of the operations in Afghanistan right around when I was getting out that are both represented in this Brett guy. We'll get into it as we get down. But the, the possibility, and if you, are, if you are in the military, correct me. At the moment I sound crazy, where you could get a brigadier general alone, <laughs> where he had to draw his sidearm. <laughs> Most of them don't have them loaded if they carry them at all, because why would you? You, you are, it's like they have the coolest fucking like cosigns, General Mattis. <laughs> if he, he shoots to qualify. It would be, it would unironically be, it's such an insult. It's so crazy. I have to describe this because just in one fucking couple of paragraphs, he has gone just insane. And it's something I've seen in other shit too, because there is a disconnect between how the military works and how, um, especially like rich white conservatives want to see the military, which is this organization of, of unimportant non-faces run by these gentlemen poets who, who who ride in on white horses and and speak French and stuff, but also do curse words and, and like I would I would kill a guy with a with a pool ball if I had to. <laughs> they want that vibe. And that's just not how it is. Um it would be an insult. Like if you wrote a fucking biography, like if you just insinuated to General Mattis, Mad Dog Matt by the way, call sign Mad Dog. Fuck. Fuck. Um, if you suggested to him for a moment that his Marines weren't good enough to keep him safe to the point where he would be the only one left alive, that would be the probably only time he fucking like would put one. He'd probably just laugh at you. He actually wouldn't even get that mad. He'd be like, that's, that's fucking stupid. You know, you're talking about United States Marines, right? Um, but it's just wild. Uh, the lack of knowledge about the military in this is fucking phenomenal. Uh, and it only gets deeper. I know I had to take a gigant. We're only like 10 seconds in. But the knowledge gaps are fucking insane. Insane. So you just have to understand that this is a Brigadier General with an unloaded M9, just fully shot out, sitting against a wall in downtown Kabul with no Marines around. <laughs> How'd he get out of the base, by the way? Bases... Uh, in Ben Shapiro's world, by the way, basically, are just like other federal buildings that you can just approach, basically. And if you jump out of a window, you're like outside of the base, which is gnarly. The vast majority, almost every single base I've ever been on is like a wall or like checkpoint posts, like manned by people with long scopes and fucking, you know, whatever the fuck. And then just no man's land for forever. That, that is just nothing. And then more walls with more guys and then shit inside. Um, the, 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 to get outside of the fortifications of the vast majority of bases that I've been in with like notable exceptions like fobs when I was in fucking like Ramadi and stuff, you could probably like jump out of it. You know, I mean like fucking you know, shout out Absharika, you know, you could literally jump out of a window if you knocked all the fucking sandbags out first. But it's, it's just crazy. It's just crazy to think. Um, we're going to get into it. I, I can't read any of your guys' stuff just yet, but we will pop back to this. <sighs> okay. 
so yeah, he's here. He's talking about everything. Brett Hawthorne was the youngest general in the American military. We're gonna try to fucking hand wave him fucking running around for this entire book. He'd grown up in lower middle. He'd grown up lower middle class in Chicago. His mother and te- his mother a teacher. His father a salesman for a local phone company. When his dad lost his job, the family moved from the more expensive North Side to the South Side of Chicago. Poor, industrial, and heavily black. I included this. Because I got to say, okay, so if I look at this thing, it'll tell me the percentage. So we're 4% of, of the way into the book, 4%. And we have the first N word. Uh, thank you, Ben, because I knew you couldn't help it because it's fiction. So Ben can't write the N word in, uh, in nonfiction because, you know, probably, I think, I don't know. Maybe he does, but we get down here and it's, I said, of course, because he goes, it's a white guy in a black neighborhood. Of course, every black guy just wants to fucking kill him all the time. That's his childhood. Um, I said, Yard growled. Yard, if you if you would, don't, a gigantic black dude. Did you just call me the N-word? Because I just heard you call me the N-word. Which, first off, is not how any black teenager has ever talked. I'd like to get into it like deep, but like, I know that that, that, that kind of setup can happen. If you're trying to just pick a fight with somebody in order to jump them, you know, and get it started, you can say like, whatever, like, did you call me that? Like, Hey, what the fuck did you say? What the fuck did you say? But it starts, it's, it sounds like that, right? What the fuck did you say? The fuck did you just say to me? Like, what the fuck? Oh, yo, Hey, he just called me like this. Like you, you get everyone involved because there's no reason for it to be small and interpersonal. You're trying to jump somebody and have a justification for beating their ass. It's not like. <laughs> I said, yard growled. Did you just call me? <laughs> if you can, if you can stretch your imagination to the impossible lengths of just imagining what it would sound like, and I know this sounds crazy, for Ben Shapiro to say the N word. <laughs> I don't think I have to fill in the blanks for you. Four percent of the book, and we get our first N word. Completely unnecessary. The fight could have happened any other way. It's black teenagers picking a fight with a uh, with a with a little honky in the in the, in the fucking uh, in the cafeteria, a little white boy. Um, a lot of different ways to pick that fight. Um, I've had people pick fights with me to jump me. I have lost. <laughs> it's just you just it you just say anything right, and you it can literally just not be that word. Easy to work around. Not adding a lot to the story, but th- but Ben, good on you. You got to get it in. Because if I was Ben Shapiro, you know, would I, would I not put the N word in a story? If you get a chance to do it, you know, you type it out to your friends on your phone all the time, half your emails, N word this, N word that. Can you believe these N words? Uh, Just finally just being able to like, as like a body deep sigh, just write it as, 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 uh, as, as just a statement in a book. It's got to be exhilarating. Yeah, finally. Finally. <laughs> I thought it before I started reading it. I was like, I bet the N word is almost fucking 10 seconds into the start of this thing. And I was right. And I was disappointed that I was right. Cause it felt like yet again, dunking on a Fisher price hoop as somebody that could actually like put it on, put it in a 10 footer. You know what I mean? <laughs> Uh, by the way, you guys are going to assume that uh, Ben Shapiro's dialogue is stunted and written by somebody who does not understand human beings throughout the entirety of this book, and you are correct. Uh, that's just, it's, it's constant. I just scrolled down a little bit. The N-word happens a lot in this chapter. Um, Brett is saved by his new favorite friend, one of the good ones. Um, a kid named Derek, right? Um, Derek is the first and I believe last sympathetic black character in the entire book. Um, if there's another one, they are on screen like a sniff. How he diffuses this um, conflict. Now, if you know anything about the world, anything at all, and you were going to say that uh, a, a, a fucking rich white racist from California was writing a book and he wanted to show that black people and white people 
can actually get along sometimes when, when fucking black people aren't being ignorant and violent, how would you show that black person, who's one of the good ones, um, diffuse a situation? Would it be through talking? Would it be through a deep personal understanding of this other member of his community who, through years of, you know, interpersonal conflict and knowledge, has gotten to understand and he can, like, talk him down? Would it be through just, I know this is an easier answer, um, fighting the guy and, and, and solving it through violence? No. No, my friend. He does it by singing. Because, <laughs> of course he does. And what song does he sing? A teenager. What song does a teenager in a Southside Chicago uh, high school sing to defray this situation between this fucking new white kid that's going to their school and this large black individual? He sings Ebony and Ivory. Because of course he does. <laughs> now, now, don't you be bothering my new friend here. Ebony and Ivory. Together in purr. Come on, everybody. And he sings for the white boy. <laughs> Damn, dude. Last black character with uh, any protagonist vibes at all. Do we see him again after this moment? Only time will tell. Um, that's how Brett met his best friend and learned how to talk his way out of violent confrontation. I think you sang your way out, buddy. Oh, my God. We keep going down, we keep going down. Uh, okay, so what follows throughout the entirety of this chapter is a profile, a literal, like, news profile on um, this fake fucking general, right? Um, it Like, literally a news profile. So it's just... From there, he went to blah, 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 blah. After this, he did this, blah, 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 over and over and over again. It is fucking exhausting. I'm going to try to skip through as much. I've highlighted some stuff. I don't remember all of the reasons why I highlighted shit. This book is, I fucking shit you not, the mental equivalent of just fucking mainlining Robitussin through an, like a fucking injection in the corner of your eye. It, 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 is, it is a manic dream of just stereotypes and bad writing. Uh, the next thing I get down to... <laughs> this is when he's describing his uh, wife who he meets. She's in Charleston. And she is the only woman in... South. This is Charleston, South Carolina. The only woman in Charleston, I believe probably ever, who would be interested in talking to one of the cadets at the Citadel. He goes to the Citadel because, of course, he goes to the Citadel... It is the West Point for the cools, okay? No loitering, cadet. This is him falling in love with his wife. That's why I highlighted it. The voice was, the voice was musical. For some reason, the image of a woodwind came to mind. A southern woodwind. Since her accent sang of long summers and lemonade. <laughs> Shout out anybody who watches through this and then... Timestamp tags me and is just like, I don't understand what's wrong with that line. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, and of course, uh, we get down a little bit. So maybe his way with words didn't win Ellen, but his persistence did. By the time he bought his fifth picture, she agreed to a walk. By the tenth, they were going steady. Two years later, they were married. Uh, this is him describing courting Ellen, his wife, who is not very well described in this, but becomes a major character later in the book. Um, she's she's in the book, additionally. But I think it's just funny that he <laughs> stalked his wife by consistently buying her pictures of something that happens before. I can't fucking remember what it is. Um, he was just 22, and they sent him down to Saudi Arabia. If you guys want me to read, this is just... All of this is just biography. It's all just a little endless biography with very little thrown in to fucking spice it up. There's almost no dialogue. There's almost no interpersonal interaction, which is par for the course for Ben. It, unironically, I think in a way his writing is strongest here because when he has to use his real imagination and think through things and just consider how people would deal with situations and interact, he is woefully inept at that. Uh, the next thing we go down here, 
Oh, let's see. It was all very Lawrence of Arabia. Okay, yeah. So he's he gets a lot of experience with fucking Afghanistan, whatever. After a quick victory over the Taliban, 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 uh, CENTCOM in Afghanistan ordered his promotion to Lieutenant Colonel, the youngest in the Marines, and assigned him to the security team for Central Kabul. That Pashto was really paying off. Um, yeah. Apparently, this guy beat the Taliban, I think, is the, the, the thing. So he got promoted to, like, Lieutenant Colonel from Major. He was just in the military for a while. I think I just highlighted that because that sounds fucking absurd. I don't know why. I guess it's because I, I don't know why. Um, oh, yeah, it's because CENTCOM. Why would CENTCOM can't really, like, order your promotion, from what I understand? Uh, Central Command. Um, because it's an act of Congress. So, like... You can't order Congress. I, I might be making a mistake with this with officers, but from what I understand, you have to send all of this up and then fucking Congress sends it back down. Uh, that, that's the only reason I highlighted that. This is just a bunch of shit. We, we find out the take a bullet for you, babe. Take a bullet for you, sweetheart. That's how he talks to his wife. Um, then, yeah, okay. So we get a little bit down. He gets promoted again at some point. He just does all the military shit. Then Colonel Brett Hawthorne saved the day. He'd been ushering a CNN crew around. Gotta keep these schmucks from reporting that we eat Muslims, he told Ellen, showing them Kabul. He handed candies to children, spoke Pashto with the shopkeepers. The marketplace was crowded at this time of day. Vendors hawking their wares. The security presence was heavy, too. I think I told you about this. Um, I never had an embedded journalist go out with me, although we did have the uh, two of them on my first deployment. One of them was the most hardcore human being ever. He was from Agency France Press, a uh, foreign guy um, who spoke Arabic. He just kind of checked in with our... <laughs> He checked in with our fob, I guess, to make sure that he didn't get shot, like, and rode out with us, and then just left. He just, like, walked out of the fob and then just talked to people out in town, which we were like, bro, that's fucking gangster as shit. Now I understand it's actually not as, like, insanely cool, but, like, it's still pretty sick that he fucking did that. Uh, we did have operating snipers, but even they were probably just like, who the fuck is this guy? Um, but you will have a lot of people with you um and that street is going to be fucking cleared it's going to be cleared cleared you're going to go ahead with your entire unit uh, if a fucking this is a colonel by the way i think he's a full bird he might just be lieutenant colonel i don't know this might be ben shapiro completely conflates standard military terminology between the army and the marine corps constantly constantly throughout this and marines and the army even though our ranks are fundamentally similar we refer to different ranks differently and all that shit so like in the marine corps a lieutenant colonel is a lieutenant colonel maybe amongst colonels and stuff they might not make a differentiation but you always say the right kind of rank because you have to be looking for that guy and the army they just for some reason like conflate different ranks and shit you know and mix all that stuff up you call lieutenants lieutenants whatever the fuck which isn't like really a judgment call i, I i'm never surprised by the, the the depths to which the army will fall in their slovenliness uh but in the marine corps it tends to be extremely specific um to the point where you can actually get in trouble for calling people the wrong rank so if you if you like like it, it pedantic if it sounds pedantic and childish, yes, and you will get in a lot of trouble because you called fucking Lieutenant Colonel Anders fucking Colonel Anders. Oh, did he get a promotion, Marine? Did he get a promotion, Marine? Is that what happened? He got a promotion, Marine? Lieutenant Colonel Colonel now? You Congress now? You promoted him, Marine? Uh, no staff, sorry. I thought so. Because you ain't, you, you ain't look like Congress. You ain't a few hundred motherfuckers handing out rank, are you? No, Staff Sergeant. Shut the fuck. What's his, what's his rank? Lieutenant Colonel, Staff Sergeant. That's fucking right. Go mop something. <laughs> okay. I, I Staff Sergeant. <laughs> Run away. <laughs> God damn. If you don't know about, if you don't know about Sergeant, then you, you don't know about the Marine Corps. You don't say no way. Staff Sergeant. I Sergeant. Sergeant. <laughs> yes, Sergeant. <laughs> Yut. Er. 
Those are all words. Those are real. The, all of those na- those noises I just made are real words. Those are real military <laughs> words. Uh, but yeah, this guy would not be this guy would not be fucking out here alone like that. Like a- anywhere close, you go, you shut down everything. There is a marine every like twenty fucking yards for dispersion. He's gonna have a cluster of fucking captains and majors around him that are half in charge of these Marines and want to look cool. They're going to be in their own independent stack in the interior of this. You are going to have overwatch everywhere, every fucking rooftop for like two and a half miles is going to have fucking snipers on it, or at least just fucking dedicated, uh, Dedicated fucking uh, rifleman, uh, what the fuck is that called? De- designated marksman, rifleman, non de- not a Marine Corps sniper, but like a guy with a fucking scope who's you know really a good shot, but it's still just not a sniper. They're in your fucking unit. You're gonna have crews of those dudes everywhere, miles. The entire infantry is going to be out there. I've been on these these Overwatch things for fucking highfalutin dudes that are driving through. And it was literally for the five minute driving down because fucking, you know, whatever fucking uh, fucking area ops or whatever the fuck, you know, some guy call sign Falcon is coming through like, oh, shit. And then you just go and you sit on like, hey, if you guys see anything fucking shady, you call it in super duper fast. Anyone falls asleep and the colonel gets hit. You're never sleeping again. Okay, because you're going to be clearing every fucking house that's ever fucking existed and anything that smells like gunpowder is getting dragged out in the street. Do you understand that? Like, okay, 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 okay. It's, it's don't fuck around days. Don't fuck around at all. If you're fucking in that area and you're even, even the civilians, like, we're like, <laughs> right now. Of course, it's me because I'm in a mask. He didn't know this, like, the entire time because of, like, fuel propellant on bombs like we were in Af- uh, iraq probably afghanistan too i don't know afghanistan gets like weirdly humid and shit but the whole time i was in iraq balaclava all you could see in me was this fucking the whole time and so usually not even that because i had fucking sunglasses so with sunglasses and a balaclava but i was still making the faces all right you little hole we know we, we cut little holes so we could smoke cigarettes through them <laughs> My friend Alex drew a big fucking scary face on his, and then he got in trouble and he had to turn it inside out for an inspection one time. But you're not getting close. You're not getting close to ops, 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 the fucking colonel. <laughs> Before we go down. Uh, members of the CNN, I'm just going to read this whole check. The members of the CNN crew were yawning. One of them leaned up. I, I, actually, no, I'm just going to explain what happens. A fu- uh, somehow, um, your hobby fucking uh insurgents put a bomb in a fucking living donkey that starts walking towards them with some kid who's scared this donkey gets so deep of fucking past every marine is doing push up so many fuck sergeants staff sergeants gunnery sergeants are doing push ups tonight past the entire overwatch past the fucking street crew to approach a fucking fucking colonel a fucking colonel in the street. Oh my god. <laughs> With a fucking donkey. And so he's like, oh shit, here he comes. This fucking colonel, who's just apparently alone, pulls his M9. <laughs> Which, if you don't know, is the most dog shit fucking pistol in the history of mankind. The Beretta M9, for you civilians, the Beretta M92FS... Uh, you may be familiar with it because it's in a bunch of fucking Resident Evils, and that is the maximum operating range for that gun. Three fucking feet at max. It's a 9 millimeter pistol. Exposed top barrel. Heavy as fuck. It's a great thing. To, it's a f- tremendous hammer. Tremendous hammer. Heaviest fucking pistol on earth. Notoriously inaccurate notoriously prone to like misfires and jams really extra easy to get dirty because for some reason they made the gun probably because it was already way too heavy uh, with the entire top barrel exposed so you can just fill it with sand which if you don't fall and do it yourself uh, the the I, the gods of the sand will do for you because Iraq and I think also Afghanistan to a lesser extent 
has sandstorm seasons. So if you just go outside during a sandstorm, congratulations. If that Beretta has a fucking, a, this much fucking grease or something on it, it is now an, a, almost inoperable. It'll fire one round and then go, and fucking stove, it'll try to stove pipe fucking nine mils. Dog shit, dog shit. He pulls this out, aims this fucking thing at a donkey, right? Uh, while this thing, like, the kid's like crying and shit. This dipshit fucking, and this is not the first or last uh, cowboy moment. And there's the donkey, even though it's got a bomb inside of it or whatever, has a, a blinking cell phone on the side that he can see. Lucky him. And he fucking shoots the cell phone. <laughs> Which is awesome. <laughs> and the thing is, as other Marines began to pay attention now, you're in so much trouble. The other Marines that are near him have to be like PFCs and Lance Corporals. Maybe if, well, he's actually big enough, he might have like a full like uh, MP, MPs or like QRF quick reaction force type guys that are like Servants corporals and sergeants and shit and are like they're fucking cool guys you know they're fucking sick dudes uh, and they're like whatever they, they do that like kind of security shit as their whole MOS now um, but still like that that's the, those guys are fucking it's so much they started paying attention now like they're not in Afghanistan with their life just on the fucking line in the hairiest place that you can be, if you've never walked around in a market um, in a combat zone, I've done it twice, and I will take walking around in fucking open sniper country for, over it every time. J let me walk amongst the fucking aqueducts and the muddy footpaths of the country. Uh, I had to walk through downtown SAC like two or three times, I think. I mean, technically it would be like four or six because I had to leave that fucker too. And it's just every fucking direction you can get shot from. You can get shot from underneath. You can't get shot from underneath in the fucking rice paddies. You know what I mean? It's not like really rice paddy. Whatever the fuck they grow out there on the dirt farm. We, I, I was only there for like six and a half months on my first deployment. So I, I, they, I was there long enough for them to till up the earth so I could break my ankle in it. But not long enough to see what the fuck came out of the ground. Although I did get my entire rig caught in a fig tree one time. And then... Uh, in addition to that, got caught in a fucking smoke grenade and almost like died. It was a whole. Th I'll tell you guys. So I'll tell you some other time. By the way, bite wise, Marissa, welcome. New boot goofing. <laughs> One of the soldiers moved toward the donkey. Get away from it. These are Marines. These are Marines. <laughs> Soldier. Oh my God. Unless he's just a Marine that's going to be in charge of army guys now. I swear to God, it said that he was a Marine. Maybe it's just in my mind, but in any case, a child began to cry. Cameraman zoomed in eagerly. This is absolute gold, a crying Afghan child being frightened to death by the awful Americans. This kind of goes in again and again and again, and we'll, we'll, I'll start skipping through the plot, because, but this has to be established because all of my notes are front-loaded here because it just establishes how fucking stupid this shit is. Um, Stay back, boys, Brett shouted, his voice carrying in the still air. Mind you, this is Afghanistan when, like, right after I got out. This is, like, 2010, 2011 Afghanistan. This is when fuck, the guys in my old company, 2nd Battalion, 8th Marine Golf Company, were literally in a CNN documentary about their fucking deployment that was insane. Um, I didn't go on it, and I'm fucking glad I didn't, because I would have gotten fucking shot to death. I know it. That I, I had I ran out of all of my luck. Three deployments? Fucking no. I am not going. I am not going. I went to fucking Fallujah. I went to Ramadi. I am not going to fucking Afghanistan. I don't have that much luck. Nobody does. Apparently some of the guys I was in with do. I digress. Um, everyone around him with the M4s has ACOGs. All right. You're, you're just trying, it's a fucking, it's basically like a monocular, all right, like a binoculars, you know, that you can zoom in, but it's one, and you can look at shit that's far away as though it's close, it's sick, it's called a fucking scope, um, you shouldn't say get away boys, you should just say IED, <laughs> literally just say, by the way, we're only, we're still only like 5% of the way through this, you just say IED, right? 
donkey, watch out. And don't get back, boys? Doesn't fucking mean it. Like, just nobody would say that. Maybe the one dumbass fucking, like, colonel that wanted to go out might do it. But if you're trying to make this guy not look like a fucking schlub, like he gives a fuck, um, first off, his, his fucking people that work for him should be good enough to not let a goddamn donkey with a fucking cell phone glowing on it while they're holding the ACOGs get anywhere near the fucking patrol. Uh, but also, um, say some call out. It, it's literally paint a picture with your call outs. Say what the fuck you're looking at. Cause get back boys. Everyone can hear that. And no one knows what the fuck you mean to get back from. <laughs> Cause you're not fucking talking about it. Um, then he saw it because the bomb was mobile. The terrorists couldn't use one of their hard-lined IEDs. They'd rigged it with a cell phone. No one ever rigs bombs with a cell phone, by the way. That's, like, only in movies. You, you do it with, like... Even at this point, like, you, you, you don't want to do it with a cell phone because it'll tell you what the cell phone number was and shit, right? Because it's on, like, cell towers. And also, we have jammers for that. What you would use is, like, a garage door opener, which is way cheaper. Use, like, a garage door opener. Anything, like, that sends radio signals. Garage door openers... And walkie-talkies were the most common. You know when you press a walkie-talkie squelch button and it goes like that? Like that's how you, that's the send, okay? Garage door opener, Wi-Fi, that kind of shit, all right? Um, Or just a timer. Just send the thing over there. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Also, you can still just send a wired one. Um, You can just, you can just still do that. Uh... If it's on a fucking donkey, just tell the donkey to, like, bake the donkey, go run at the guy, and then fucking leave the wire hanging out. If you're going to have a cell phone on the side of a fuck, I, I, you know, I'm sorry. My, after multiple years of doing fucking, uh, the worst goddamn IED threat assessment classes in 29 Palms, California, walking around all those stupid ass fucking ISO containers, while people are like, well, that's a bomb, that could have been in the ground. When it's not in the when it's in the ground, you can't see it. But when it's above the ground, two hundred pound bomb. Thank you, fucking Billy. Lucky that you got to fucking EAS in California, where you dipshits all get to pretend to be actors and fucking play at camp here. If I EAS at Lejeune, I either just go on another deployment or I have to sit on the fucking gate, send fucking Lance Corporals to jail for drinking. And if he called in an EOD team. Sorry, I just got... Brett could see the phone glowing on the side of the donkey. They were planning to detonate the bomb remotely by calling a number. I'm going to assume that the phone is on the outside of the donkey because unless this thing's the best Nokia ever, like, how is it inside something? It's still just on and operating. Like, when you sew the donkey up, are you going to, like, okay, the donkey is going to definitely die of serious infection because we have put a bomb in it. You guys turned the cell phone on before you put in the talkie. Omar, I have not, I have not, ah, oh, Omar, Habibi, I have not turned it on. Do you have the scissors? <laughs> Habibi, Habibi, <laughs> inshallah, <laughs> you will trip down a flight of stairs today and hit your face into your portrait of your dead father, so you will know the shame of him from heaven. <laughs> God damn. But it's glowing, so it's either glowing through the donkey, fire, or it's just on the side of the donkey, which makes a little bit more sense, but also literally no sense at all. It's fucking Hollywood bomb. I've always wanted, and by the way, I know I'm going off on a fucking tangent here, but I have always wanted in a movie when it's a fucking, uh, like, something stupid, like a cell phone that sets the bomb off. I've always wanted it to be the just the most dumb fucking phone ever, you know, like a like a Motorola Razor. Hello, Moto. That would be fucking sick. You know what I mean? But this is just remember, and I've said this a bunch of times. It's just Team America World Police. Okay. They were planning to detonate the bomb remotely by calling a number, and if he called in an EOD team, he knew the terrorists would simply detonate the bomb, taking the kid with it, and so he leveled his weapon. The cameraman zoomed in on his face, sweat pouring down his forehead. I don't know if they're talking about Brett or the cameraman's just super intently zooming in, sweating down his face, which is very Team America. 
Come on, baby. He starts on the Trey Parker voices. Brett said to himself. Uh, oh, sorry. His thumb fingered the grip, caressed it. I don't know why. <laughs> You're holding your M9? <laughs> why? Was he trying to say that he was trying to hit the fucking the, the Beretta's safety, you know, which is like right above your thumb. It's got a big fucking uh, toggle safety on it. I don't know. The donkey was now about waddling toward him. Was now about waddling toward him. I don't The cell phone bouncing in its cloth pack. There you go. The child's eyes went wide. He fired. The bullet smashed into the cell phone at an angle, shattering it completely. The donkey panicked. Took off at a dead run right at Brett. Brett fired his handgun two more times into the dirt, forcing the donkey to rear, and then Brett reached up and grabbed its brittle, using its full body weight to pull it to the ground. Then he, like, does this little thing where he winks at the fucking camera, and he becomes the hero of Afghanistan and eventually gets promoted to general. But, unironically, this is the best scene, one of the best scenes, in the entire book. In the entire book. This is one of the best scenes. And it's fucking stupid. And I swear to God. Can you not just imagine Trey Parker and Matt Stone? There's something coming right for us. Oh my God. It's a donkey. But look on the side. It's glowing. <laughs> Dirk Dirk. Muhammad Jihad. Muhammad Allah. <laughs> Holding his hand up. By the way. The fucking, uh, you know, we'll get into it. I, when I have, I have to res refrain from trying to look at stuff while I'm scrolling down because it's incessantly. There is this many pages of text until the next important thing, which like is all and just like them. Like, 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 like,